Thank you everyone for being here. I would also want to thank everyone who presented or discussed an idea because it's all relative to what I'm going to talk about. I will use a lot of examples. I might mispronounce your name. Don't try to correct me. I mean, we'll talk later. Maybe I'll convince you to change your name to sounds like I pronounced it. So we'll just go uh, have an overview over some new uh, contemplations and disciplines instigated by space travel. Uh, so this is how the uh, artist imaginary uh, picture of how they expected the Pioneer 10 to cruise into interstellar space as it gets away from our solar system. Uh, by now we have heard about the five favorable and only space traveler, <clears throat> our spacecrafts. Of course, our, my favorite are Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, who are, who are still functioning 45 years later. And they expect them to function for five more years. Now, the interesting one is New Horizon, launched in 2006. And uh, just a few months after it was launched, mainly to discover or make some science about Pluto and some other objects in the Kuiper belt, Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Uh, by that time, we didn't know what a dwarf planet is. The term was coined in 1990, but it wasn't actually used until they decided to use it to classify a new type of uh, planets. And since then, we have been using it really frequently. So we'll go a little bit over the new contemplation and disciplines and how that affects the human interstellar space travel. Uh, we'll have some examples of new uh, disciplines and uh, of impact on life on Earth. So whenever we go any place or think about traveling or any scientific adventure, we have our perception, which is always based on what we know now, the science. And later when we achieve it, we see the difference. Of course, it takes phases. Uh, yesterday, we have this Kahoot question, for example. Uh, what's the first uh, evidence for extraterrestrial life will be? And the majority of the people said that it's going to be a techno signature beyond the solar system. Well, we'll wait and see, or maybe someone else will see how close or far this will be. And again, this will change with time. And it will change with the perception of what we have now and what we will have later. So everything is based on the current science and the target that we pick. And from there, we can conclude our challenges. We know how the science and technology is advancing very quickly now on a daily basis in electronics, IT, 3D printing, Internet of Things, uh, AI, etc. And that drives the development in space travel technology. Uh, from the current science, science, when we look at it, we always have our heritage science or established, developing, and uh, the anticipated science. Then for the target, whatever we select, any space travel target, we can build that on the goals that are based on the science that we know now and we anticipate on the resources, current resources and limitations. And again, all these five items are variable, so they're going to keep changing. And we, uh, we generate the challenges there based on the six items. And then with all the changes, the changes in six items will have changes on the challenges. So this keeps going. And through this process where everything is dynamic and changing or developing, uh, the challenges will keep changing. And we know that along the way, we have some new concepts, uh, new ideas for systems, perceptions. Some new fields are emerging, uh, some new disciplines. And the signature we're looking for here is the terminology. Normally, we notice we're using new terms. Uh, many of us heard several new terms in the past 24 hours or more. And we see that they become used more and more frequently, and that indicates that we are having a new field. So space travel by itself is very tough. It's an extraordinary project. It has higher complexity. It has its own uniqueness. And it's supposed to work and perform in a very extreme environment. 
When we add the interstellar factor to that, everything is pushed to a further extreme. We have uh, extreme distances, extreme time, super extreme uh, environments, and that makes everything a little bit more complicated and more fun to study when we bring the humans along. So the humans come and they bring their limitations with them, uh, physiological, psychological, and social. So these are all the things that we have to consider when we're talking about human interstellar space travel. We can take the food beverage example. And so if we simply try to see it's a simple space trip, uh, we're not going to colonize any place. It could be a very short uh, trip to the ISS of the moon, could be to Mars, uh, some of the outer planets, moons, or even interstellar. If we just uh, try to uh, work on two uh, elements here, the duration and the supply chain, these will determine what type of or what means we will use for that trip. For example, we always pack our food when we go to the moon. It's only a 10 uh, days trip. Uh, we pack the food to go to the uh, ISS, and we have a lot of uh, replenishment for food and resources every month because of the distance. When we go to Mars, we cannot pack enough food uh, in our spacecraft right now with the current technology. And then we have to travel further and further. We have to think about how to produce food on board. For example, and even shipping food before or after will be totally obsolete when we go interstellar. And the thing is that all of these items are variables. I mean, if anything, uh, if we get any technology like we heard from Phil or uh, from Peter earlier going and kicking off in 30 years, then the variable will change. The uh, pizza delivery to Mars, that's a new term too, uh, will change what, what ways uh, we will use and means to support uh, the people with food. Uh, we have, which one is this shielding? The same thing about shielding, for example. I'm not gonna talk a lot about it. Uh, Ronke already explained a lot about shielding, but we also, we have our limitations here. And we, have, we don't have enough information, let alone the technology to protect us from radiation. And not to mention that everything is intricate and it's related to the other items. And we're not even talking about micrometeorite shielding here. We're just talking about radiation. So what are the challenges that we're talking about here? Uh, I assembled about exactly 100 items now. There were 102 items 10 years ago because everything keeps changing. And these items will differ when we go to, in a, uh, depending on the mission type. Is it a just a space trip? Is it colonization? Are we gonna stay for space in space for a while? And these 100 items are variables, so they're not only 100. They are 1,052 different ways of thinking, depending on all the variables and the elements we're talking about here. And uh, the 100 items are for interstellar space travel. But this is the big picture. When we, look, when we look at the big picture, we know that we can derive the items that are needed to go to the moon. There are about half of that. About 60% of them is what we need to go to Mars. So we can uh, deduct, deduce everything that we need to go in between here and interstellar. Uh, they are, uh, some of them are structural, environmental, and human aspects. And the good thing about it, and the most important part here, that to go interstellar or deep space travel, we need everything, we need everyone. We need literature, we need artists, uh, we need musicians. We're not talking only about engineers and astrophysicists and astronauts. So that's the big picture for interstellar uh, space travel. Now let's talk a little bit about these new terms. Uh, we heard some of them, some of them are easy to understand, space architecture, uh, space beer. And uh, we heard, for example, sometimes they are new concepts. Sometimes they are emerging by just adding the word space before a word. Uh, we heard yesterday from uh, Nico about uh, Haishen. Uh, Alana was mentioning uh, CESIS. Like in 20 minutes, she mentioned over 20 CESIS. 
Does that make it easier for us to use the term? Is it going to be uh, that popular later? What if one of these uh, international treaties she was talking about picked up actually uh, the request and they decided to protect uh, the scientific interests in some locations? Um, certainly it's going to be used and then it's going to be more popular. So how do these uh, terms start? They usually are instigate, instigated by continuous discoveries and advancements. They include science, technology, manufacturing, systems and processes, and there's a lot of overlap here. Uh, examples like astrobiology, nanotechnology, the material will be nanomaterial, uh, systems and processes like the virtual human health infrastructure that was uh, proposed in one of the crucibles. Uh, by the 100-year starship, so we have a new systems for, uh, to have infrastructure or medical infrastructure in space instead of depending on Earth medical system for everything. Uh, new approaches and measures, as we have seen in the past, since yesterday, with all the uh, suggestions and new measures for detecting life on exoplanets. Uh, new classification systems, like with the dwarf plants, for example. Uh, how are they originated? Sometimes they just branch naturally to specify that we are doing something specifically for space or exoplanets. So you have a lot of exo, and then we continue. Uh, sometimes they are proposed by individuals or by institutions, and mostly for either classifications or organizational purposes. Uh, it might be a rising necessity like the uh, space biomaterial that was proposed by Dr. Jamison on OLABC. That's just an example. Sometimes we advocate it. Like what we do with the crucibles, for example, the 100 YSS, we look for the problem and we push from a multidisciplinary background uh, aspect, and we see what's really needed, what's the problem, and start advocating a new uh, discipline or a new uh, concept to go. And certainly, it's about utilizing pre previously coined terms, uh, like what happened with the dwarf planets, like what happened with artificial gravity. The term itself has been around since 1883. But the more work we do with, the more experience uh, we do with and research, the more popular it will become and probably just will use it without noticing that it's becoming part of our scientific lingo. So what's the impact on Earth? Uh, I mean, we're going, doing all these good design for interstellar uh, interstellar standards here. So everything has to be uh, more durable, more precise, no maintenance or uh, automated and totally sufficient. So how does that affect us? Uh, I'm gonna skip the direct benefit via the applicable innovations like um, we invented cordless tools to work on the moon, now everyone used them, I'm gonna go skip over that. Let's talk about new perceptions here. Launching the made in space industry how producing in space, for example, just on the, on the G, uh, G0, the ISS, how that helps in manufacturing, get better crystals and uh, the fire, fiber optic industry, for example. And as we've seen in the past two days, that's going to keep developing. How in pharmaceutical, for example, we got bigger protein crystals, so we have more efficient medication. I'm not going to go over and over, but you got the idea about we're talking about made in space industry. Now, using space resources for space and for Earth uh, objectives. Uh, again, here are just a few examples. Mining, when we get raw material from space. First of all, we are using for space local material, and we are cutting on depleting Earth from its resources. Uh, fabrication and assembly in space, wh whether we are looking at uh, producing the mined material in space, a lot of processing will happen there. But also we save a lot of, for example, of water. For, a lot of water is used on Earth for cooling. The amount is huge, and we don't have that problem in space. And we can go through many examples. Now, what about space economy? How does that affect us? Uh, around 2020, the size of the space economy was estimated at $350 billion. Uh, it's mostly in satellite business and launching systems. And the 
estimate we get here from some people who know about the economy, it might hit about 1.5 trillion in 2040 and 3 trillion in 2050. Now, this is a huge part of our economy. We're talking about numbers equivalent almost to the oil industry. And we know how big and important that is in all aspects. So when we talk about space, uh, again, the effects of space, we have to keep in mind the characteristics that we are designing for space economy. It's a new age. We're using the emerging technology, the state of the art technology. Uh, we're using uh, all the data and big data analysis. So we're pushing everything to the best limit. And certainly, you can just imagine how that reflects on all the production on Earth and for Earth. And uh, it's an ongoing, there's some scientific ongoing benefits, of course, as we travel interstellar or on the steps to go and reach interstellar travel. We know that uh, we're gonna, there's a lot of science involved. And again, this is the best uh, quality design we can achieve. So I'm going to conclude here. And uh, Again, what does interstellar space do to space travel and all the related items? Uh, how, how do we push the envelope here and get the most of it and get the big picture so we can resolve all the small things? And most important of all, it really shows that everyone is in. We need every background and every expertise to be able to achieve that. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we'll see you at the platform.